Praise the Lord. If you are still there, I said, Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you because this is your word, the Bible that you have given us. And you want us to study this word and prepare for heaven. We're praying, Lord, tonight your spirit will teach us from your word in Jesus' name. We pray, oh Lord, that the word will teach us to become practical, useful, profitable in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you grant us the spirit of understanding. Keep us awake that you will not be asleep while the study of your word is going on. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And everybody say a good amen. amen. We have been studying the Bible in the book of Revelation. And now we're in Revelation chapter 11. If you've been following us through the study of the word, you'll find that the Lord himself had sent his angel, who had been revealing these marvelous, wonderful, mysterious things unto John the Beloved. And it is a revelation because it's something that had been hidden. The mystery of God himself. And now it's opened up, it's uncovered, it's revealed, it's unveiled before us. That's why it's called the revelation. And we've been seeing that is the time, the time we're in now, that is in our study, is the time when the rapture will have taken place. And there will be the great tribulation on the earth, upon all the inhabitants of the earth. We've gone through the seals that have been opened. There are seven of them all together. Between the six and the seven seal, there was an interval. And then when the seven seal was broken, you have the trumpet judgments coming upon the people because there were seven angels bearing seven trumpets. And the trumpets were being blown one by one. As the, prophet, as the trumpets were being blown, then the drama of the visible judgment of God was being dramatized before John the Beloved. And it's recorded everything for us. But you'll also find out between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, there is an interval. It is inside that interval, within that interval, we find ourselves now as we study chapter 11 of Revelation. Actually, this interval, this parenthesis, this pause uh, that you find between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet actually started from chapter 10 and it continues till chapter 11 verse 14 and this passage we're looking at which is chapter 11 reading from verse 1 actually is introducing to us true witnesses two evangelist prophets who will preach with supernatural signs and wonders during the great tribulation for a period of three and a half years as you read the book of revelation sometimes you'll find these three and a half years Yes, it's put as 42 months, 40 and 2 months. Or sometimes 1,260 days, 1,203 scored days. But all they mean the same thing by the, by the calculation if you look at everything. The people would have had opportunity, would have opportunity to listen to the gospel, to hear the word of God from these two men, supernatural people actually, that is people that are mightily anointed of the Lord. They are called the two witnesses and they will have a worldwide ministry the first 14 verses of this chapter actually are a continuation of the interlude of the parenthesis which began in chapter 10 the first two verses just introduce the passage to us let me read those two verses to you in revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 and there was given me a reed like a rod like unto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and them that worship therein but the court which is without the temple live out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. There you have the three and a half years again, forty and two months. Now it says, uh, the very first scene that uh, John was instructed, you must remember that in chapter 10, at the end of chapter 10, he had been given the role of a book. And he was told to open his mouth and to eat that book. And we explained last week as we studied that passage that it means to devour it. 
and to digest it and to read and to understand and then to proclaim it eventually in the eating of it it will be sweet in, in the reception in the receiving of the revelation of god it will be a delight it will be something sweet and joyful and wonderful but then as he meditated on the revelation it was going to be something bitter because it was going to proclaim the word of god the warning of god the judgment of god the devastation the destruction that will come on the various nations and peoples and tongues and kings it was going to proclaim to them lamentations and mourning and woe that's why it will be bitter inside him but now after all that sin is passed he was told now it was given a read that is if you've seen a tailors before they have this measuring rod or measuring stick or measuring tape or measuring rule and then it was given this read it was a measuring rod it was to rise up and measure the and measure the temple of god measure what does that mean what does that mean when it says measure and it wasn't to measure the whole earth it was just to measure the temple of god and the altar and them that dwell therein ah measure if you've uh, gone to a place to buy clothes before and you say i want to buy clothes how much do you want to buy how, how many yards or how many meters do you want to buy then the person selling will take something like uh, a tape roll and then measure out whatever is measured out what's that for for your possession and so as you see the measuring here it is to be measured for possession and for protection and for preservation and so he was told measure it out what am i to measure out just the temple of god because that part will belong to the lord and then you will measure the altar remember when you go to those people selling clothes and they measure out you do not possess every everything in their hand it's a big roll of clothes the only part they measure out belong to you the measuring is for possession then you take it you preserve it and then you take it you make it your own it's for ownership and so now it was to be measured out the temple and the altar and the people that worship therein then you take that thing that have been measured out you go to the tailor and what's the tailor going to do the tailor is going to measure you you are the one possessing it you are the one having it the the clothes itself has been as measured and you yourself now you are measured still telling us about the possession then it said the court which is outside the temple which is without the temple you leave that one out measure each knot why are we not measuring that because that one is not given to you because it's given to the gentiles and the holy city that is jerusalem they shall tread on the food for three and a half years for 40 and two months for 1260 days and so you understand then that as john was given the rule was given the rod he was to measure the temple but we're asking the question now which temple because if you are studying your bible very well you understand that the temple in jerusalem that was built by herod which john knew very well had been destroyed that's what jesus said not a stone will rest upon one another and ad 70 general titus from the roman army had destroyed that temple that was 26 years already even before he in the book of revelation which temple now is he to measure this is the temple that will be built during the great tribulation you need to understand that at the beginning of the great tribulation while the force uh, while the first seal is broken there'll be a kind of false peace and the antichrist will take over daniel called that antichrist the prince please look at your bible in daniel chapter 9 daniel chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 27 in verse 27 and he shall confirm the covenant with men for one week it's a week of seven days one day standing for a year that means seven years and then it says and in the midst of the week in the middle in the middle of the seven years that will be three and a half years in the middle of that shall he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease you understand if there has been sacrifice then there has been a temple because the jewish people will not have sacrifice without temple but in the middle of the week that temple is going to be desecrated by the antichrist and then it says and the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate this is exactly what jesus 
Jesus was speaking about in Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Uh-huh, holy place. Do you know how the temple of the Jewish people were designated? There was the holy of holies inside and there was the holy place and then there was the outer court. And as Jesus Christ mentioned that what Daniel prophesied about, when you see the abomination, when you see the antichrist, when you see that one in the revelation that is referred to as a beast, as an animal, antichrist, antichrist is anti the lamb of god is a beast as you see him standing in that holy place in the temple whoso readeth let him understand let him understand that there'll be a temple it's called the great revelation a temple and that temple it they'll be sacrificing there for three and a half years in the middle of the grow of the tribulation that he is before the last three and a half years then he will change the covenant and he'll say no i wouldn't allow you to do that again in fact it's good to set up himself as if he were God in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away force, and that and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. And so he as God seated in the temple of God. Do you see that? That's the time of the great tribulation. The one that opposes all righteousness is the Antichrist. He will sit in that temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so that's the temple that John was now being instructed. Measure it up. Because the Antichrist will not possess it. Is going to be for the possession of the people of God. And you are to measure the altar to you. Where they will be sacrificing. That is where Daniel said the oblation and the sacrifice will be offered. And then you will measure also the people that are worshipping therein. That is the Jewish people in the time of the great tribulation. That will be remembering their God and they will be worshipping. Rise up and measure. Why? You see to measure the temple. I have told you just now in scripture. That to measure a place is either for the purpose of destruction or, the, or for the purpose of possession in this case now is for the purpose of protection for the purpose of possession and for the purpose of preservation let me just show you in the word of god that sometimes when you say you measure a land or you measure a place or you measure a city number one it could be for destruction number two it could be for possession in second samuel chapter eight Second Samuel chapter 8, reading from verse 2. In Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 2, and it's much more. This is destruction. And measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Do you see this? In the measurement here, he measured them with a line. And then he smote them and he cast them to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so Dave, and so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. In that uh, passage now, that's for destruction. The measurement we've read about in that second Samuel. As you go to Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3, you will also see uh, another reference to measuring up a particular place or measuring up a particular territory and determining the perimeters that are to be destroyed. In chapter 3 of Habakkuk, reading from verses 5 and six it tells us before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet he stood and measured the earth he beheld and drove asunder the nations and ev and the everlasting mountains were scattered and the, the perpetual hills did bow his ways are everlasting again the measurement there is for destruction you'll see now the other side that sometimes when you measure something it is not for destruction it is for possession look at Zechariah chapter 2 Zechariah chapter 2 reading from verse 1 Zechariah 2 verse 1 I lifted up mine eyes again and looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand then said I Whither goest thou? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breast thereof and what is the length thereof. 
And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And he said unto me, Run, speak to the, this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited. This measuring now is for possession. And it shall be inhabited. It's for preservation. It's for protection. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. And the, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire. Protection. Protection. Preservation. Round about her. And will be the glory in the midst of her. As uh, you see that, you understand then, as we read in the Revelation, that uh, there is going to be measurement. That measurement of that temple is for preservation. Here it is for the purpose of protection, possession, and preservation. But then it says, for the court, which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and, and the holy city. When you hear the holy city in, in the Bible, always, 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 always Jerusalem. The holy city, that's Jerusalem. The holy city, Jerusalem. And it says that holy, uh, that holy city, Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. After the measurement to determine the perimeters of what belongs to God. Signifying the place and the people marked for divine ownership. The ministry of God's two witnesses during the great revelation is now revealed let's see the two witnesses now as we come to revelation chapter 11 revelation chapter 11 we have already studied verses 1 and 2 we're not looking at it from verse 3 and see the ministry of these um, of these uh, two witnesses revelation chapter 11 reading from verse 3 and i will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three scores the sixty days uh, clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the god of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these are power to shut the heaven to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will and when they shall have finished their testimony the beast that's the antichrist or the one representing the antichrist the beast that shall uh, that ascendeth out of the bottomless beast shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called sodom and egypt where also our lord was crucified and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer shall not permit shall not allow their dead bodies to be put in the graves and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth after three days and a half the spirit of life from god entered into them and he stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them at the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were frightened they were terribly afraid and then it says and he gave glory to the god of heaven the second war is past and behold the third war comes quickly and that's what we find today and that's what we're going to study today i divide the study uh, to three parts number one the description and the power and the resemblance of the two witnesses you know that the passage itself is centering on the two witnesses point number one will be the description and the power and the resemblance of the two witnesses number two the death the preservation and the resurrection of the two witnesses the death preservation and resurrection of the two witnesses and then point number three we're told about this what happened then the destruction the punishment the reaction of the wicked the destruction of the wicked the punishment of the wicked the, the reaction of the wicked we come back to point number one 
the description, power, and resemblance of the two witnesses. I read to you again from Revelation chapter 11. And notice these verses as we read from verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. God will raise up two witnesses. And these witnesses, actually, you see that they are prophets. Because it says in another verse uh, down below as we go on to study. And it says they shall prophesy. It tells on 203 score days, clothed in sackcloth. And it says these are the two olive trees. What does that mean? It means that another passage of scripture somewhere had spoken about them, referring to them as the two olive trees. And those who read that passage in the Old Testament, they had been wondering, Two olive trees, two olive trees. Where are they? What are they? Who are they? What will they do? When will they come? And then the Lord said, During this great tribulation, these two prophets, these two people that will be so anointed with the power of God, and they will prophesy and proclaim the word of God 40 and two months, 1260 days, three and a half years. They are the two olive trees, they're the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, not wanting their message, not accepting their message not wanting their ministry to continue if any man will hurt them fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will mighty prophets indeed great prophets indeed the two witnesses but look at them one by one now as we look at all those uh, phrases there when it says i'll give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand a thousand and two hundred and three score days close in sackcloth and then it says these are the two olive trees come to zechariah chapter 4 zechariah chapter 4 and see the identification and the description of uh, these uh, two witnesses that we're now studying about in zechariah chapter 4 reading from verse 2 and verse 3 and said unto me what seest thou and i said i have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lambs thereon and seven pipes to the to the seven lambs which are upon the top thereof look at verse 3 and two holy trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof do you remember what we read in revelation chapter chapter 11 verse 4 these are the two olive trees and in this passage in zechariah it says and two olive trees by it zechariah continues in verse 11 he tells us then answered i and said unto him what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof uh, you see when he talks of the olive tree he talks of that in the, the people of he said they understood that's the uh, kind of a uh, tree that produced their oil and their oil was to be fed into the lamps and it will bring the light and the lord used the symbolism or the illustration or the type of the olive tree so that you, you will know that these people that will be represented by the olive trees they'll have the oil of the spirit and then they'll show the bright side and the bright light of the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And then it's a lamp. It's the light that shows the way that I should walk. These will show the way. These will preach the word. These will reveal the mind of God. Even in the dark age, in the dark time of the great tribulation. And the Lord was saying that there will be the olive trees. And I answered again in verse 12 and said unto him, what be these two olive branches which though which uh, through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves do you see that they are they are emptying out the golden oil out of themselves again is symbolizing they'll have the fullness of the spirit of god the spirit of power and the spirit of conviction and the spirit of authority that will be upon them at that time that's what we have read in the revelation in verse 13 and he answered me and said knowest thou not what these be and i said no my lord then he said then said he these are 
two anointed ones, anointed with the Holy Spirit, that symbolized with oil, that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. They stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Come back to Revelation chapter 11 and in verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. And it says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Exactly what we read in Zechariah, standing before the Lord of the whole earth and standing before the God of the earth. But it says something here. It says that in, at the end of verse 3, they'll be clothed in sackcloth. They'll be clothed in sackcloth. All through their ministry, their clothing will be that clothing of the sackcloth. Why sackcloth? Because it will be at a time of womb, at a time of lamentation, at a time of the judgment of God, at a time of the wrath of God upon the earth. And because of that, it will be like they are mourning for the earth. And they are warning the earth. And they are warning the inhabitants of the earth. Why don't you obey God? Why don't you give your heart to the Lord? Why don't you believe in the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Even at this time when the judgment of God is being poured out upon the earth why don't you give yourself to the Lord and as they see those people rejecting and you see the people the antichrist and the people being drawn after the antichrist they are mourning that's why they'll be in sackcloth in Jeremiah chapter 4 Jeremiah chapter 4 reading there from verse 7 Jeremiah chapter 4 reading from verse 7 the lion is come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way is gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate and thy cities shall be laid waste without an inhabitant for this guard you with sackcloth lament and howl do you see that because of verse 7 the lion will come in the land and will destroy a lot of the gentle people and because the wrath of god the, the judgment of god is poured out because of that close yourself with sackcloth for the fierce anger of the lord is not turned back from us as uh, these uh, two witnesses will be looking at the thing that was happening and they will see the judgment of God being poured out on the earth, they could not dress in any bright way, in any joyful way, as if they were celebrating. No, they will not be celebrating. There will be woe, there will be mourning, there will be crying, there will be lamentation. Because of that, these two witnesses will be clothed in sackcloth in verse 9, and it shall come to pass at that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes and the, and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder the prophets will be wondering when will this come to an end there's another thing we learn about uh, these uh, prophets look at revelation chapter 11 now as we look at revelation chapter 11 you, you learn something about them in verse 4 it says standing before the god of the earth standing before the god of the earth you know that these are prophets and these are men it is uh, this different from gabriel the angel or different from michael the angel standing in the very presence of god it's like when elijah was talking to ahab and he said in first kings chapter 17 first kings chapter 17 reading from verse 1 and he said and elijah the tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead said unto him as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand before whom I stand here is a prophet of fire here is the prophet of power. Here is the prophet that's able to shut the heavens and there will be no rain. Here is the prophet that's able to bring fire down and then it will consume the sacrifice and even consume the gainsayers and the opposers. And he says, you know why I'm able to do that? You know why all those plagues and all those miracles are taking place? Because I'm a prophet of God standing before God. Before whom I stand, there shall be, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word these uh, two witnesses were reading about they will be as powerful in fact as powerful as elijah and they will be able to manifest the great power of god they'll be able to shut the heavens they'll be able to bring fire down they'll be able to uh, do whatever miracle they need to do so that their ministry will continue all the specified time that the lord had given them we'll come back to revelation chapter 11 and in verse 5 it says and if any man will hurt them 
fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. You see, the people of the world, they know their history. And they know that uh, when the gospel began to be preached from the Acts of the Apostles, anyone they didn't like, they imprisoned them. Anyone they didn't like, they killed them. Anyone they didn't like, they were, you know, put in a dungeon. Anyone they didn't like, they'll stop their ministry by killing them, stopping their lives. So they think they'll be able to do the same thing too. And at this time of the Great Tribulation, when these two prophets of God, these two witnesses, these two olive trees, these two candlesticks, when they will appear and they'll be declaring the message of God, the mind of God, the revelation of God to the people, they will want to hurt them. But then it says that fire will proceed out of their mouth and will devour, will destroy, will kill, will put to death the people that oppose their ministry, oppose their message, oppose their, their person. Uh, you, you know that that happened at the time of Moses. It happened at the time of Elijah as well. Look at the time of Elijah. In 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Uh, you'll see that, you know, this prophet, that's why it's called the prophet of fire. In 2 Kings chapter 1, reading from verse 9, then the king sent unto him a certain a captain of 50 uh, with his 50. And he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of an hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said unto the captain of the fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again, also, he sent unto him another captain of the of fifty, with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus says the king, thus had the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Uh, do you see that? Uh, this is exactly the kind of power that the uh, prophets, the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the ones we are reading about in Revelation chapter 11, this is the kind of power they were have. I told you that even in the time of uh, Moses, Moses had that same kind of power uh, to turn water into blood and then for fire to come down for some mysterious things to come uh, to come upon the people that oppose his ministry and message. In Numbers chapter 16 Numbers chapter 16 reading from verse 28 Number 16, 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open a mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertain unto Korah, and all their goods, they... And all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and they had closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. Listen to this, Numbers 35. And there came out a fire from the Lord, and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. It happened at the time of Elijah. It happened at the time of Moses. That the people that opposed the ministry, the message, the word that the Lord had sent. Fire came through the ministration of these uh, prophets and then destroyed the gainsayers. As we look at Revelation chapter 11, you also find some other things that are manifested in their ministry. It tells us in Revelation chapter 11... And in, the verse, in verse 6, it says, These are part of short heaven. 
that it train not in the days of their prophecy. We read that already in the case of Elijah. And then it says, and they are power by the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. In Exodus chapter 7, reading from verse 20. Exodus chapter 7, reading from verse 20. This to refresh your memory, I'm sure you should have known this story yourself. In Revelation, sorry, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 20, it says, And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, and in the sight of Pharaoh, and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Uh, this is the account that when the children of Israel were remembering what the Lord did on their behalf, uh, they, they recollected what the Lord had done. In Psalm 105, reading from verse 26, Psalm 105, verse 26, is Saint Moses, a servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen, they showed his signs among them, and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. That is, Moses and Aaron rebelled not against his word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. It's going to happen again at the time of the great tribulation when these two mighty prophets, the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, when they come and they testify and they witness for the Lord and they preach the word of God. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, reading from verse 43, it says how he had wrought a science in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zohar and had turned the rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. Then he tells us, as you look at uh, these uh, two witnesses, you see that uh, they will really be mighty. And he'll do mighty, miraculous, wonderful things that the people of the world will wonder at. As I told you, it's uh, very similar to the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Elijah. It tells us in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, reading from verse 10. It says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses. Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that all that mighty hand and in all that great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. As you read the last book of the Old Testament, that is Malachi, the very last chapter there, chapter 4, reading from verse 1, you will see that there's an expectation that when the day of the Lord shall come, that is the time we're talking about now, the day when God will visit the earth with judgment, that prophets like Moses and prophets like Elijah are actually being expected. It says in Malachi chapter 4, reading from verse 1, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud ye, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. For, ye, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him unto him in Oreb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the lord he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest i come and smite the earth with a curse and so you find the description and the power and the resemblance of these two witnesses now please understand you see how, how that subtitle is given 
the resemblance of the two witnesses. That means that these two witnesses, they resemble Moses and Elijah. We are not saying that they are Elijah. We are not saying that they are Moses. We are just saying that they resemble Moses and Elijah. During that great tribulation that will come, there will be these two witnesses. These two witnesses, they will be preachers. They will be prophets. They will be evangelists. And they will prophesy. That is, they will proclaim the truth of God with signs and wonders. These two witnesses, Witnesses, you know, some people they say, Well, the two witnesses are Old Testament, New Testament. No, sir, it's not like that. And some people say the two witnesses are law and grace. No, it's not like that. They'll be prophets. Some have even suggested that they will be Moses and Elijah because their ministries are very similar to that of Moses and to that of Elijah. But we're not told exactly that. Some other people have said that these will be Enoch and Elijah. The reason those people say that and identify these two witnesses as Enoch and Elijah is that those two men did not die. And according to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, it's appointed unto men once to die after this the judgment these people that say these two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah they claim that everyone who lives on earth must die but that there is going to be but they don't understand they don't understand what they don't understand is is that uh, that uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 uh, there are some people that are going to escape it because there's going to be a whole generation of people that will never taste death that's why it says we shall not all sleep but we shall not all die but then in a moment in a twinkling of an eye we shall all be changed that means it's not everybody that will die and so you cannot identify these two witnesses with Enoch and Elijah or with Moses and Elijah the only thing we know is that their ministry will be a ministry of miracles similar to the ministries of Moses similar to the ministries of Elijah that's the simple truth. We know that these future prophets, their names are not given and they are not properly, they are not totally identified. We do not know beyond a shadow of doubt who they are, but we know that there will be two witnesses that are powerful and they will prophesy for 1,203 score days, that is for three and a half years, that is for 42 months. That will be the period of the second half of the, of the tribulation. And that is called the Great Tribulation. During all the period of their ministry, as we have read, they will be clothed in sackcloth. That's the garment of mourning, indicating it will be a time of lamenting, a time of lamentation, a time of grief, and a time of woe on the earth. Now we come to point number two, the death and the preservation and the resurrection of the two witnesses. I come to Revelation chapter 11, and I'm reading to you from verse 7. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished, their testimony when they shall have finished their testimony before i go on can i tell you something that uh, the the antichrist or the beast or the people of the world couldn't do anything against them to terminate their lives until they had finished their testimonies these two witnesses cannot be killed until their testimony is finished until god gives his permission though they are hated by the entire world they are invincible not invisible invincible unconquerable nobody could terminate their lives until they had finished their ministry in the purposes of god in the sovereignty of god every minister today is invincible indestructible and cannot be killed until his work on earth is finished and you need to have that confidence in your heart as a child of god if you have something to do for the lord and the lord has told you here is what to do the lord is assuring you you're invincible you're untouchable you're indestructible until you have finished the ministry he has given you according to the word of god your life is kept secure in the omnipotent hands of the almighty god until your work on earth is done until your task is finished uh, have you noticed that uh, people in the word of god it's when they finish their ministry that then the lord will permit now you can leave you're finished we're told in acts of the apostles chapter 13 acts of the apostles chapter 13 reading from verse 22 it says in verse 22 acts 13 verse 22 and when he had removed him when he had removed Saul, he raised up unto them david to be their king to whom also he gave testimony and said i have found david the son of jesus a man after mine own heart which shall fulfill all 
my will, shall fulfill all my will. Because God has said that. Even though Saul was chasing uh, David about, he could not get him. He could not catch him. And he could not destroy him until he finished and fulfilled everything the Lord wanted him to do. Look at verse 36. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. He couldn't die until he fulfilled the will of God. I about Jesus Christ himself in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 4, it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And it's only after that now you come to verse 13. Now I come to thee. Now I come to thee. I'll not be with them in the world anymore because I've finished my job. And since I've finished, now I'm ready to come. That's what you'll find about Paul the Apostle in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul, why are you going like that? Your, the time of your departure is that no, because verse 7, I fought a good fight, I finished my cause, I've kept the faith, there's nothing I'm waiting for anymore, I've finished the job, and since I've finished my, my work, now the time of my departure is at hand. It assures us then that God says he'll fulfill the number of your days and as, as long as you still have something to do for the Lord, and you are concentrating on that scene, not the Antichrist, the people that are opposed to Christ, and not the beast the people represented by beasts with beastly nature can touch your life because you are invincible until your work on earth is done until you accomplish your work in jeremiah chapter 1 jeremiah chapter 1 i'm reading to you there from verse 10 in jeremiah chapter 1 verse 10 see i have this this set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down then to build and to plant i hope you are not surprised about the ministry of uh, jeremiah which says you are to pull down and then you are to dig up and then you are to throw down you are to destroy and after that you are to build and you are to plant when you get to a forest and you want to build a great mansion a great edifice what you do first you pull down the trees and you pull down all the hindrances there you dig up all the foundation and when you've thrown away all those things now you are ready to build and you're ready to plant and then it tells us in verse 17 thou therefore gather up thy loins and arise and speak to them all that i command thee be not dismayed at their faces lest i confound thee before them for behold i will make thee they i have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land against the kings of judah against the princes thereof against the priests thereof and against the people of the land they shall fight against you jeremiah but they shall not prevail against thee if i am with thee says the lord to deliver thee that means then as long as you have the ministry and you are concentrating on that ministry you are invincible nothing can touch your life until it is finished that's why we're told in revelation chapter 11 come back to revelation 11 and we're reading from verse 7 and when they had finished finished their testimony when they had finished their ministry when they had finished all the will of god that they needed to do that they needed to accomplish it says the bees that ascend us out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them that's their death and then in verse 10 in verse 8 it says and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city which spiritually is, so, is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Mm, what does that mean? That is their dead body after they have been killed then it says that they will remain in a place that is called Sodom and that place is also called Egypt and then it says it's a place where our Lord was crucified I thought as I looked at the New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John that Jesus Christ was crucified in Jerusalem yes you are right but it says now that Jesus Christ was crucified in Sodom and then in Egypt 
What could that mean? Let me show you what it means. Jeremiah chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 23, you see uh, the people of Israel were so bad at this particular time that uh, the, their lives were so bad and they were compared with the people of Sodom. They were compared with the Egyptians. That's why at this time, Jerusalem itself, where Jesus Christ was crucified, is now referred to as Sodom. It's referred to as Egypt. In Jeremiah chapter 23, I'm reading verse 14 and 15 I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem and horrible sin they commit adultery and they walk in lies and they strengthen also the hands of evil doers that none does return from his wickedness they are all of them unto me as what as Sodom and as the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah therefore thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets behold I will feed them with warm wood and make them drink the water of God for from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land so really he's talking about Jerusalem that is they will kill them they will destroy them and they will not allow their dead bodies that is the dead bodies of these uh, two mighty prophets they will not allow their body even to be buried for uh, three and a half days they'll be rejoicing that they have overcome their enemies let's look at uh, um, revelation again chapter 11 Revelation chapter 11. We're looking at it now from verse 9. And they of the people and the kindreds and the tongues and the nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a an half. And they shall not suffer, they shall not permit, they shall not allow their dead bodies to be put in the graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these true prophets, these true prophets, Prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. It says that uh, these uh, two prophets, because they tormented them, they, they, they be so happy that eventually they are being killed. Eventually they are being destroyed. And then it says in verse 11, and after three days and a an half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and it stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them that is three and a half days hey, do you see how god is working out things three and a half years three and a half days after three and a half days that these uh, mighty prophets have been slain and they have died and they didn't allow their bodies to be uh, to be buried then the spirit of life came into them what does that mean the spirit of life the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead will come upon them and they too will rise up in Romans chapter 8, chapter 8 verse 11 but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you that's the spirit that will come upon them and then it says they will rise up and when they rise up then they'll hear a voice saying, come up hither. Uh, some things are really going to happen at that time of the great tribulation that will terrify the people of this world. Uh, we're told in uh, Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 9, and it shall be to me a name of joy and a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth. When that happens, you can imagine because they'll be seeing it and they'll see it over their internet, they'll see it over their television everybody will be able to see because when they tormented the earth everybody was afraid and they couldn't hurt them and these mighty prophets these two witnesses anybody that wanted to destroy them in the days of their ministry fire will come out of their mouth and consume all those enemies and everybody was uh, will be afraid and eventually they're able they're able to overcome them overpower them and they die and you can tell the people of the world everybody will be watching them on the telly that these people have died they thought they were mighty they thought they were powerful and they will not allow them to 
will be buried. And then three and a half days after, they just rise up. And everybody will see again. It will be to the joy and to the praise and to the honor of the Almighty God among all the nations which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Uh, you see then what will be happening at that time. Uh, these powerful men with prophetic ministry, with peculiar manifestations, their resurrection and their ascension will be seen by all the people on the face of the earth at that time. We'll come back to Revelation chapter 11. In Revelation chapter 11, uh, looking at these two witnesses, we now learn about the sin that happened to them in verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven and in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. What's the effect of that upon the people of the world? What's going to be their reaction? We come to point number three the destruction, the punishment, and the reaction of the wicked. The destruction, the punishment, and the reaction of the wicked. We're looking at Revelation chapter 11, reading from verse 13. Revelation 11, verse 13. And the same hour was there a great earthquake. And a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake was slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted. They were terribly terrified and afraid. And it says, and he gave glory to the God of heaven. The second war is past, and behold, it's not ended yet. The third way, the third war cometh quickly. It tells us that at that time, that is at the time of the triumph of the two witnesses, as they ascend up to heaven, there'll be a great earthquake. And as that earthquake will happen, a tenth part of the city will be destroyed, devastated, demolished. And then it says, 7,000 men instantaneously because of the eruption, because of the volcanic eruption and the, and the, and the earthquake, 7,000 men will be killed in that earthquake. The rest of the men will be so terrified, they'll be, they'll be afraid, and they'll get into alarm. That is, they'll be so alarmed land and uh, it will mean that uh, they will not know what kind of calamities will still come upon them because they will recognize this is punishment and judgment coming from the almighty God but uh, they were so affrighted and what they did was that they now gave glory to God they will stand in awe at what God will be doing they will acknowledge that this is the power of God in their terror they will give glory to the God of heaven but well, giving glory to the God of heaven, will that be a permanent thing they will do? Or is it just a temporary thing because of the fear that came upon them at that time? As you look at Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah chapter 50, reading verses 10 and 11. Jeremiah chapter 50, verses 10 and 11. It tells us over here in verse 10, And Chaldea shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied, says the Lord, because ye were glad, because ye rejoiced, O ye destroyers of my heritage, because ye are grown far as the heifer, as gr at grass, and bellow as bulls. Why are we reading such verses? It's saying that these people here, punishment will come upon them because they were joyful, because they were happy at the calamity of the people of God. These two witnesses, when they were killed, what was uh, the world doing? The inhabitants of the world, what were they doing? They were rejoicing. They were sending gifts to one another because the two prophets, the two witnesses, the two olive trees, the two candles because the people that came to show the light of the mind of God, the revelation of God, the word of God unto them, because they had been killed, they were rejoicing. That's why the calamity will come. That's why the earthquake will come. And then the disruption and the destruction of the, of the world at that time will claim souls, will claim those uh, people. It mentions the earthquake. You know, when such an earthquake happens and the mountains are shifted and the hills are shifted and, and the rocks are blown 
run out of places, there will be disturbance, there will be commotion, there will be destruction, both of property and of life. You see a similar thing that had happened earlier in Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 12. Revelation chapter 6 verse 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood. Then in verse 15, the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? When that earthquake, when that eruption, and destruction, and commotion, when it happens in Revelation chapter 11, the people will realize that God is at it again. God is bringing destruction again upon the people of the land. It is the day, it is the time of the judgment and the wrath of God. In Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13 from verse 6, How will ye? For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. When that earthquake happens, after those two witnesses had been taken to heaven after their resurrection, then there is that ascension, and the earthquake takes place, they will know it is destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every heart, every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid, and pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. And then uh, it tells us in Luke chapter 21, uh, Jesus already predicted this, prophesied it, and told the people that at a time of the great tribulation, calamities will be taking place, and the hearts of men will be failing them for fear, for uh, they'll, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll be affrighted. In Luke chapter 21, verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. As you come to Revelation chapter 11 and the latter part of verse 13, and the remnant were frighted, and he gave glory to the God of heaven. They gave glory to the God of heaven heaven. Uh, please understand, uh, these people that give glory to the God of heaven, what happened after that? After a few chapters, look at chapter 13 and read from verse 4, chapter 13 verse 4 of Revelation, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? These people that were so affrighted, they were so afraid, and they were giving glory to God. They said, God, when I honor you, God, we now we salute your power, we salute your courage, we salute your authority. You are mighty, and you're able to give life to these two witnesses. And they went like that, and then the earthquake, and these people died. They were afraid, and they gave glory to God. Temporary, it wasn't permanent. It didn't give them a real, definite experience of coming on the Lord's side, because you find here that after just uh, chapter 13, now uh, they were worshiping the dragon, and they were worshiping the beast. And were worshipping the Antichrist. They were saying, who is as mighty? Who is as powerful as a dragon and the beast? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. The same period. The same period. Power was given unto him for 40 and 2 months. Three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And them that dwell in heaven. And yet, what were they doing? Uh, the people of the they asked, that were afraid that they in the middle of chapter 11 and they were giving glory to God in the middle of chapter 11 but now they were worshipping the beast, the antichrist and that's exactly, that's what people do that's what people, temporarily, at a moment of time, when something devastating, something destructive something that claims life, when it happens they are afraid, and then they mention God, and they seem to be giving glory to God, but thereafter uh, they go back to their evil ways Numbers chapter 16 
in Numbers chapter 16. I'm reading to you from verse 32. Numbers chapter 16, verse 32. And they hath opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Coram and all their goods, they and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit and they hath closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them that is those people Korah, Dathan, Abiram and the people that supported them when they earth opened and swallowed them up then the children of Israel they became afraid they cried and they fled and for they said lest the earth swallow us up also then you will think that these people now they were going to have a permanent change permanent repentance and definite experience of relationship with the Lord, honoring the Lord for the rest of their lives. Look at verse 41. But on the morrow, second day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against their own sin. Ye have killed the people of the Lord. They were calling the rebellious people the people of the Lord. They were calling those who opposed Moses, who opposed Aaron, who opposed the word of God. They were calling them the people of God. They were calling the people that the judgment came upon, a kind of judgment that never happened before and the earth opened up and swallowed them up. They were calling them the people of God. They said, you have killed the people of God and it came to pass when the congregation gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared and Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation and the Lord spake unto Moses saying get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment the people that were so much afraid when the earth opened up and they ran and they fled and they said we, will not, we don't want to perish in the judgment of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram but the following day that fear had evaporated, it had gone and there are some people like that they see something out, they become afraid or they say oh God I will serve you for the rest of my life, I will not do that again oh God ah, I didn't know, it is like this, that person that died I knew him, we were practicing evil together we will not do that again and the second day they have changed because they are fright, because they are giving glory to God is temporary and then God said now in verse 45 get you all from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment and they fell on their upon their faces and Moses said unto Aaron get, take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath there is wrath there is wrath gone out from the Lord and the plague be, is begun and Mo and Aaron on to as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation and behold the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed but before the plague stopped now they that died in the plague were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah you see as the people they change so quickly how many times did you come to the bible study and you know it gripped you and grabbed you and shook you and convicted you and you maybe you wept like a baby you called upon the name of the oh lord i'll not do that again i'll give glory to you i'll serve you for the rest of my life and then a week after that bible study the effect and the impact of that bible study is totally gone from you it should not be like that when we hear the word of god or we see the judgment of God upon the unbelievers we see the judgment of God upon the people that are not serving him and then something happens that will say that ah what if that had happened to me what if that vehicle had crushed me what if I died like that with all this sin in my life oh God I'm afraid I give you glory I give you honor for the rest of my life I'll serve you I surrender unto you and the following week how about it and the following month I about it does it still remain the lord wants us to have something permanent he doesn't want us to have something that is you know just temporary in revelation chapter 14 verse 7 revelation chapter 14 i'm reading to you from verse 7 it says saying with a loud voice fear god and give him glory 
That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to fear him. He wants you to give him glory. Revelation chapter 15 verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Who among us there, seeing all the things that will happen at the time of the great tribulation, will not fear the Lord and escape for your life because of the judgment that's about to come upon the world. But when it happens, when you fear God, make it permanent. Turn to Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 14. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to call to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. You see God uh, talking about his people, talking about Ephraim. And this is the Ephraim that he actually loved and appreciated and said, Ephraim is my dear son. How can I forget him? I remember him still. But now he said, because of what Ephraim had done, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away and I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. That's what the Lord wants. When you see the devastation, you see those calamities coming upon people, the Lord is saying, I'm going to tear them in pieces. I'm going to bring judgment upon them. I'm going to bring the earthquake of my wrath and my terror upon them. When I've done that, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense or until they seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. And then in chapter 6 verse 1, come, let us return unto the Lord. Uh, so see the devastation. Uh, well, if we have eyes to see, if we have ears to hear, if we have minds and hearts to think. Look at the people that are dying of HIV AIDS. Look at the people that are dying of cancer. Because for many years we preachers have been warning them of these cigarette smoking. We've been warning them of the adultery, of the fornication, of the prostitution. And they shook their head and they closed their ears. They will not hear. Now incurable diseases are coming upon millions and millions of people. Now that you see that, shouldn't we be afraid of the judgment of God or the hand of God and talk to one another come let us return unto the lord for he has torn and he will heal us he has smitten and he will bind us up after two days he will revive us in the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight and then shall we know if we follow on don't let it stop here. Then shall we know if we follow on. Don't let your repentance, your fright, or your fear of God be temporary. If we follow on, don't you let it. Don't let it be like uh, those people were reading about in Revelation chapter chapter eleven, verse thirteen. They were frightened and they gave glory to God. And then in chapter thirteen, they are turned back and they were giving glory to the to the beast and to the antichrist. And they were saying, "Who is able to make war with him?" Don't let your repentance be like that. We shall know if we follow on to know the Lord is going forth is prepared as the morning and it shall come unto us as the rain and the latter rain and the former rain unto the earth I pray the Lord will bless us I pray the Lord will turn iniquity away from us and as we see the hand of God judging unbelievers all around us I pray that we will be so much afraid of the terror of God of the judgment of God then we will turn to the Lord and fully remain with the Lord and our experience of giving glory to God will be permanent in Jesus name let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer the Lord wants us to see his son see the handwriting on the wall see what is happening around you see the judgment of God that is coming upon your own unbelievers are you not afraid what 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 if you had died what if all this and writing on the wall shall come against you that your kingdom is measured and your kingdom is divided and you'll no more continue and then life is coming to an end now why don't you tell the Lord Lord, I had your voice. I'm afraid of judgment. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Why don't you come to the Lord and say, Lord, for the rest of my life, no more sin, no more evil, no more wickedness, no more iniquity, no more adultery, no more fornication, nothing again that will make you angry with me. I thank you because I know you love me. You don't want me to perish and I come to you today. Lord, I surrender everything to you. I give myself completely unto you. All to Jesus, I surrender all to him. 
him I freely give. From now on, I'm going to be glorifying God. I'm going to be glorifying God. I'll go out there and let my light so shine. It will shine in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. It will shine every time that woman come back who have not finished. That woman in the large auditorium come back who have not finished. Get her for me. Come back. We have not finished. We want you to pray. Talk to the Lord and tell the Lord that here you are, you, you want to, uh, you want to serve the Lord for the rest of your life. Nobody walking around now, nobody walking around. Don't prove rebellious during the time of prayer or we'll study the word of God. Let the word of God enrich your life. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I give myself unto you. I've heard your word and I will not allow your word to just go like that in vain. Be afraid of God. Jesus said, fear God. He is able to kill the body and drive the soul into hellfire. That lady, I'm still calling you back. I don't want you to go now. I want everybody to stay there and pray. Get her for me and bring her over here. Bring her over here, please. Talk to the Lord. When you hear the word of God, you give yourself to prayer. Talk to the Lord. Let's talk to the Lord. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? 